Hello. <laughs> okay, folks, because it's noon, and because now we realize that we have a, a hard constraint with this other class that comes rumbling in here at 110, we're going to go ahead and begin to what? Four of the semester? It is flying by. So today, uh, we actually have two things going on. One of which is I'm going to first introduce you to Dr. Bill Kurtzneider, and then Bill is going to introduce our distinguished speaker for today. And Bill is wearing multiple hats at the moment, one of which is he's the interim director of our Group Institute for Marine Coastal Sciences. He's the director of our Brute Marine Field Lab. And some of you may not be aware, Bill's also a part of our Army School of Public Health. About a year, well, what, nine months ago now, after about 18 months uh, of <laughs> trying to get it into place, we signed, <laughs> well, not technically a memorandum of agreement, but we established an agreement with the College of Arts and Sciences to link Bill and his efforts, a lot of which are tied to issues of community engagement, to what we're doing here in our School of Public Health. And in particular, for those of you that are in the MPH program, as part of our ENHS 730 course, we do an immersive experience in Georgetown, focusing on Georgetown County, the city of Georgetown, and Hawthorne Barony as an immersive one to three day experience. And it's called PH Field, so P-H-I-E-L-D experience. And Bill is intimately, more so than he may realize at the moment, going to be involved as we move forward with it. So Bill, welcome to our seminar series. So it's technically our ENHS, OHHC2I graduate student organization seminar series. And I have the privilege of working with Katya to help coordinate for the fall semester and Dr. Sean Norman does for the spring semester. And with that, Bill, I will turn it over to you for the introduction. All right, thank you very much, Dwayne. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, I am very excited to be integrating more fully with ASPH, uh, but um, we've got a wonderful opportunity uh, today to hear from Dr. Leanne Kermides. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say a few words before she embarks um, on her thing. Um, so I'm not gonna steal any of the thunder, but I, I I can reinforce what you are going to see from Leanne, you will think that's not America, <laughs> that, that can't be happening here. And you will um, get to see how, you know, in some senses Appalachia really is a different place and it is deserving of more attention. Um, I think you're also going to see um, somebody that's a, a wonderful advisor and I know this, this intimately um, too, of my former students have gone through um, Leanne's lab. And I got a feeling that somebody in this room is gonna be contacting Dr. Kermitas after this <laughs> yes. uh, with hopes of, of joining um, her, her, um, her lab as well. Oh, I have so, openings. I have, I have some openings for next year, funded. Uh, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, there's funding, you heard it. Yes. <laughs> So um, I, I do want to say just a few things about, about Leanne. So um, she is currently an associate professor at Virginia Tech in biological systems engineering, which is a wonderful program. And she um, sits in this, <clears throat> in this space between environmental engineering and public health um, that I think is a really interesting place to be. And um, having collaborated with, with Leanne in the past, um, it, I, I will say it, it definitely is, and you're about to see it. So let me uh, turn things over to Leanne and let her take it from here. Bill, thank you so much from one of my all-time fave collaborators. And I will, uh, this, well, if anyone's interested, definitely talk to me afterward. So let's get this party started. So, uh, we're going to talk about drinking water in the Appalachian coal fields, and I'm just going to get into it. I like to begin every talk with some thank yous because as scientists, we never work alone. Um, some of my primary current, current collaborators are Dr. Alistair Cohen over in, he's actually in VT Vet Med, so he's a human epidemiologist. 
as well as Hannah Patton, who came up as an undergraduate student with Bill at St. Francis. She has been at Virginia Tech now since um, 2017, has gotten her master's of science and her master's of public health, and is this close to wrapping up her PhD. So she will be Dr. Patton soon. I also would like to thank Austin Wozniak, who's an undergrad student who did a lot of the spring work with me, and Dr. Nick Cook, who was the graduate student that I first was working with when we discovered uh, the Spring Reliance. Ironically, Nick and I were working on work in Kentucky and Virginia related to wastewater. Um, and then that led us to discover, shocker, drinking water is also a problem. The work you're gonna see today was funded by several centers at Virginia Tech, a private donation, and the Appalachian Research Initiative for Environmental Science. So this is a group with a strong focus in public health, I don't need to perhaps tell you that water is important. I will remind you that it is Sustainable Development Goal 6 under the UN, Clean Water and Sanitation for All by 2030. That is an ambitious target that I'm not sure we will even meet in this country. Water is key not only because it is a source of potential contamination, but we need water to be healthy. So you can't go without water either. Now, before I talk about Appalachia, I do want to provide critical perspective. We are very fortunate, despite hearing things about Jackson, Mississippi and Baltimore, Maryland recently, on a population scale, the whole nation, we're very fortunate here in the United States, the majority of our citizens do have access to improved drinking water sources. However, I read a paper when I was beginning this work that made a huge impact on me. So I always like to begin these talks with it. Um, and this paper, which was written about 15 years ago, argues that water and poverty are connected in these unique, complicated ways, regardless of the country you're in. So solving problems here in the United States gives us insights necessary to export that knowledge elsewhere. It also, I would argue, in the sake of equity, is a reason that we should perhaps take more seriously some of the solutions that are being proposed overseas. But to just get us started, here is the audience participation part. I do some work overseas as well. In both of these pictures, I am collecting water at the point of use, so right prior to human consumption. One of them I'm in Central America and one of them I'm in the United States. Which one is which? You have to guess or we'll be here past 110. I look at the vegetation, see if that yeah. gives up. Oh yeah, people sometimes use vegetation or what I'm wearing, what all, all context clues are appropriate. Someone make a guess, you got 50-50. Right is the US. Right is the US. So that's mountain laurel in the back on the left hand side. <laughs> The one with the where I'm wearing the purple shirt with the metal pole. That mountain laurel to the, the, on, in the back. So the one, so we're saying that the one where I'm wearing the purple shirt is in the United States and the jean jacket is overseas. That's my guess. All right. So it's actually the opposite. Um, but this is just to show you. And I picked ones deliberately at the, the right season so you don't get many context clues. Although I will point out, no one here said, oh, Leanne, she's wearing flip-flops in one. Surely that's not in the United States. She'd be following appropriate field rules. Unfortunately, that is me in um, Appalachia and the one where I'm in the purple shirt, I'm in Guatemala. But this is just goes to show that there are places in the United States that where getting your water for your drinking water bottle looks exactly the same as it does in um, developing or middle and lower income countries. So I've talked a lot about Appalachia. For those of you not familiar with the region, here is a standard map. And um, these are the counties designated as Appalachian under the Appalachian Regional Commission. This is a political definition. The counties roughly lay along the Appalachian Mountains. Sometimes people are surprised that Mississippi and Alabama are included. I cannot explain what's happening in Tennessee at all. Um, but this is roughly where Appalachia is. Unfortunately, when you think of this region, you think of mountains, but you also think of poverty. Uh, you'll see in this map, we have the county distressed at risk, transitional, competitive and attainment designations. 
I will note that even Virginia Tech, which is in a county right on the edge of Appalachia, we are technically in a transitional region. And the areas that I'm gonna be focusing on are in Eastern Kentucky, Southern West Virginia, and Southwest Virginia, which you'll see are largely pink and red. Also, just in case you're wondering if this is relevant, you are actually in an Appalachian County even, or an Appalachian state, even though I usually think of the beach with South Carolina, you have some mountains. So several years ago, Washington Post put together this map. These are all the counties in the United States that lack indoor plumbing. Over 2 million people in the United States do not have access to um, flushable toilet and drinking water in their home, which is pretty shocking. These areas are largely clustered in areas of indigenous populations on the border with Mexico and in Appalachia, other rural regions. But this really doesn't tell the whole story. So you can see Appalachia has some very dark areas there where people are lacking indoor plumbing. Because even if you do have indoor plumbing, what if the water that comes out of your tap you can't trust? Just last year, there was a comprehensive analysis of serious drinking water violations throughout the United States. So these are municipal systems that fail to meet the Safe Drinking Water Act. And in addition to Hawaii and Puerto Rico, West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, and Southwest Virginia really light up. So these are folks that they have indoor plumbing, so they wouldn't show up on the previous map, but they have water that they cannot trust. So where would you go if you didn't have an in-home source? You might go get bottled water. That can be very expensive. I'll also say that a lot of these places are in food deserts where there aren't a lot of groceries. You could rely on neighbors or family, but that assumes that they are in a better situation than you are. It also assumes that you have the social relationships to do so and the way to transport water. Water is heavy. Maybe you rely on public roadside springs. This, uh, these roadside springs are something that if you're in this region, you can't help but notice after you see my talk. So as on this slide, they are just places people go to gather water, generally off a little side road off of a highway. So we have called this water scavenging in Appalachia. And here are a few other examples of what these springs look like. I first noticed these while doing a wastewater study on the border of Kentucky and Virginia. And I had an undergrad who was game for an interesting project. And so I said, hey, why don't we start measuring the water quality at these sites? So we started collecting samples. We collected samples at over 21 different springs in uh, five states. You'll see right there along the Appalachian chain and Appalachian counties um, between 2016 and 2018. 99% of samples, so all but one, were positive for total coliform, which means that they were not sterile. And 81% of springs were positive for E. coli at least once. So that violates an EPA maximum contaminant level. That would trigger a, bo a boil order because it would pose an immediate health risk if this was a regulated water source. In terms of other contaminants, we saw some springs that exceeded manganese and aluminum. These are secondary maximum contaminant limits, so they might change the taste or appearance of water. And then really fascinatingly, there were two springs that consistently were well above the recommended sodium guideline. And I mean like 10 times above it. Um, and that's a concern because in this area, there are a lot of people who are trying to stay on low salt diets. Now, these high sodium levels led us to wonder whether these were actually springs. Um, for those of you who aren't hydrologists or are kind of scraping open that information, springs are anywhere that the topography cuts into groundwater so groundwater comes to the surface. So this is a very stylized picture here that one of my PhD students years ago made. Anywhere that the water cuts into the aquifer, if it's under pressure, it'll bubble up. Otherwise, it'll trickle out. In this area of Appalachia, it's a very karst or karstic, depending on which term you like, region. So there are a lot of caves. That means that groundwater is not as protected as we think. Lots of times, folks, I joke that we think almost like fraggle rock, like it's just this pristine pool under the, under the ground. 
in reality, groundwater is flowing. It's going to move through media and pick up anything along the way. It's not protected from the surface if you have these cracks and bedrock that are kind of direct conduits. So we have a much more intimate connection to potential pollution. Now, the really exciting thing is we were wondering if these were springs and started talking to some folks in West Virginia. And they said, well, look, at, for example, here's one of my springs. It almost looks more like a waterfall. And they said, well, that's not a spring. That is an underground mine outfall. And so it turns out the more PC thing to say is that these are mine mediated aquifers. And um, this is water from a historical mine that has been closed and then filled in with groundwater. They tend to be high in salt because they're leaching out weathering rock. Um, ironically, the salt then cuts down on the bacteria. So I don't know. So we started doing this work. Like I said, I had this valiant student who was excited to drive around and find these springs. And after I started looking at the data, lots of folks said to me, okay, Leanne, but are those really thing, places where people get water? You know, you were directed by the local health department or you saw one guy visit there once. Are these actually sources of drinking water? And so we had to come up with a way to figure that out. So this is one of my favorite little, who knew that other research areas had such interesting ways of answering questions. Um, I talked to Virginia Tech Institutional Review Board and they said, look, you can't possibly uh, take pictures of folks. Like you can't set up a game camera because we have privacy concerns. You can't set up motion detection because you'll get deer, other things. But we'll call over to Virginia Tech Transportation Institute because they get pictures all the time of people in their cars. So I called up Austin and I said, hey, here's my university card, go get some ladies pantyhose and Vaseline. And he was like, I have no idea what you've signed me up for, but it turns out this is an established way to obscure identity. So we took game cameras, we put Vaseline and then covered them in pantyhose. And you can see from this picture, you can see that that's a human. You probably suspect it's a, a white human, maybe a man, can't really tell, so we could maintain privacy. So I just think that's just a fun way to uh, talk about different ways that people answer questions. So we left the game cameras and then we left a short spring survey with self-addressed envelopes at several springs. And uh, we had about three dozen surveys returned. And here's what we found out. First of all, people absolutely visit the springs. Um, our game cameras recorded anywhere from four to five visitors a day. Most people reported that they visited the spring at least once a week. That's actually pretty shocking when you think about how far these are off the beaten path. These are not, you know, you have to know where these are and drive up a holler and then have a way to haul water home. People primarily use the water for drinking. Almost everyone was collecting it directly to drink without treatment. And they used this source because they said it either tasted good or that it was of high quality and was good for their health. So why is this? Um, we got, now this was just a short survey. You know, we made it very clear. It was four questions that multiple choice designed to take two minutes. But people wrote me these really long letters and I had all this marginalia. People wanted to tell me about their springs. And this one, this one person said, you know, being raised on spring water was an honor. It's so much better than nasty chlorine tasting city water. Other folks said they've been coming to this spring for 80 years or they drank water from it every day on the way to school. I had one really darling couple tell me that the spring actually had a historical marker and they went to the local library and copied information and sent it to me to tell me about their spring. So these are incredibly valued parts of the community landscape. Um, we have not been, we now are maintaining a website when we were really early doing this work, we were providing the data as requested to local health departments. Thankfully, we didn't attract, add our name to everything. There was one county in West Virginia where there was actually the local newspaper read their 
number one editorial was about the spring and they were very insulted that anyone would suggest that there was any health risk related to their spring. They had even paid, this community had even paid to have a concrete marker put up by the spring. So I'm sure I will be honest, I kind of thought, huh, well, this is a case where we should educate people that the water isn't as good as they think. Um, and this is just a public health education issue. And then I was at, if any of you are ever in the region and you wanna to go to a really cool place, um, in 1900, the highest density of millionaires in the country was in Bramall, West Virginia. And they do it, even though there are only 300 people that live there now, they open up all the old mansions and do a crazy Christmas party every year. And while I was there, I saw this book, A is for Appalachia. And I bought it for my kids to prove to them that mom does cool stuff and that we live in a cool region. That can be hard, especially as now one of my kids a teenager. And lo and behold, when I got to W, W is for water. And the last thing in this kid's book said many of the old timers complained about the awful taste of city water because they preferred to drink water from their mountain springs. And reading this and recognizing the really passionate responses I got from folks about their springs made me start to think, maybe there's some truth to this belief. Why are people so passionate about this water? So this is where Hannah Patton came in and began her master's. We did a small study where we examined home water quality and spring water quality. So we went to two dozen homes. These homes were relying on six springs. So obviously multiple homes per spring. And we went and collected water directly from the tap, administered a short survey, and then collected spring water. So we were able to compare the water that they had at home. Everyone in this group had water in their, at their tap and the water from the spring. Not surprisingly, the majority of folks did not trust their home tap water. That's why they were drinking from the springs. Now to show you what we saw, and I recognize I just put a whole bunch of numbers at you, but I'll walk you through it. So in the center, I have the Safe Drinking Water Act recommendations or guidelines. So health-based, taste and aesthetics, and guidance levels. And on one side, I have spring water and on one home water. Now, if we look at the spring, it is indeed positive for E. coli. So like I said, that would trigger a boil order. That is not so great. While the home water sample wasn't positive for E. coli, it did have high levels of barium, which in the long term can cause cardiovascular issues. Also, astronomical values of sodium and high strontium. Even more critically, if you look at the values related to taste and aesthetics, very high iron, manganese, and conductivity. So here's what the water looked like. The water that was coming out of their tap was the water that is that orangey brown color, whereas the water from the spring was clear. So I don't care what public health intervention or education campaign you try, there is nothing that is gonna make me preferentially drink that orange water because you say that the clear water is gonna give me an infectious disease risk. So that's kind of the situation we're at. Not surprisingly, the folks in the study, they all said they drank spring water because it tasted better, it looked better, and it didn't smell bad. So again, I'm peeling back an onion here. Like I said, I've had a long time kind of puzzling this out. Why is this the case? Why are we in a situation where people are preferring to drink water totally unregulated, coming out of a pipe in the mountain that may come out of an underground mine, as opposed to water that they can turn in at their home? Part of this is the way that the economic situation is changing. A lot of these little towns were based on the extractive industry, original, originally timbering, then coal, now natural gas. They were boom towns. They put in small drinking water plants. And as, the, as we've had out migration and the population has been reduced, they do not have the tax base, the financial resources, or the people power, the capital, 
and the knowledge to run these water systems. So even when you have a water treatment plant, it may not be functioning at the level necessary. Oop. Sorry, press the wrong thing. Here we go. So this is not something that is confined to Appalachia, although the system is more extreme. This is a map from one of my PhD students, actually now a uh, interdisciplinary scientist at EPA and one of Bill's old alumna, Christina Marcello. So we did a study of safe drinking water violations throughout the United States and found that very, very small systems in isolated areas like those in Appalachia are at the greatest risk for monitoring and reporting violations. So not only do they have health problems, they can't even, they don't even have the resources to adequately monitor their water to determine if it's meeting guidelines, which is why things like that brown water can happen. So I'm an engineer, you all are in public health. What is the solution? What is the intervention? Long-term ideal, we want to invest in better infrastructure. That's one of the primary goals of the ARC. They do a great job, but of course there is a lot of need out there. Um, there's also a lot of need even beyond Appalachia as we see in the news. In the short term, there's some movement around the idea of developing these springs into water kiosks. This is a picture of a water kiosk in Beverly, Kentucky, where they took a place where people were collecting water, piped in water from a treatment plant so it was fluoridated and chlorinated, and then sold it for pennies for the gallon. Um, it became a place where people also developed a farmer's market and was somewhere people could come fill cisterns for very low cost and it was protected water. And I do think this is something I definitely think would be interesting to try more broadly in the region. But in the meantime, both of those take a little bit more involvement. What can we do at the point of use? We are currently using examining point of use filters as a potential decentralized solution. So these are just commercially available pure filters. Um, we're targeting homes dependent on private wells using the filters that were used in Flint. I'm at Virginia Tech, so we're lucky enough to have the Flint water group right across campus. We're installing these at the primary tap and then monitoring at the primary tap with the filter and an unfiltered tap. So we have a built-in control in case water quality changes over time. Do they work? It kind of depends. Commercial water filters are actually designed for metals. And in some cases we see very good reduction in metals. We also even see reduction in coliform and E. coli. So we have a picture of not filtered water, which is very high in coliform and E. coli, and then filtered water where it is below detection. However, there are cases where there's almost instantaneous failure. So this is a water filter where the gentleman who was trying to use it called me 48 hours later and said, this isn't doing anything. I really don't wanna mess up your study, but I need to take it off because I can't even get water out of my, my faucet. So in this home, the iron level was more than a hundred times the secondary maximum contaminant limit. You can see the iron encrusted on the filter. And in this case, that little filter is just not enough. So this project, which is ongoing, I'll talk about it a little more at the end, um, led me to this idea of what are the actual lived experiences of people experiencing plumbing poverty in Appalachia. Uh, I was doing this study on point of use. This is, we're getting into the work that I presented at UCOR. We have all these national studies now, which are really great showing geographical hotspots, where plumbing poverty is concentrated, where people cannot trust the water at their tap. But those numbers, as powerful as they are in justifying interventions, they don't say what it's like to live under these conditions. So for example, they don't say what it's like to have to wait in a line at a roadside spring to collect drinking water or to have to collect 12 or 14 gallons in milk jugs at a time and have that be all the water you rely on for drinking and cooking. They don't talk about the fact that we still have folks here in the United States who have wells where they actually have to drop a bucket on a rope. This well at the bottom is kind of interesting. It's hard to understand, but as an engineer, 
you have this kind of long metal tube and it's dropped down into that borehole tube. And that's how you collect water that you're going to feed yourself and your family. So the problem is, of course, I'm an engineer. And so I'm lots of times just stuck behind my computer in my lab. But as I was thinking about this, I also got sabbatical. And um, that meant that I actually had the time to pull back a little bit from classes and work here at the university and really spend time with folks experiencing plumbing poverty. And I decided to focus in McDowell County, West Virginia, because I knew that I was already monitoring some springs there and we had some community contacts. Just to give you an idea of McDowell County, it is the eighth poorest county in the nation. The median income is under 30,000. In 2017, they had the lowest life expectancy for both men and women in the country. Now, men are still lowest life expectancy, women are second lowest in the country. So a small bit of improvement, but still quite dire. And in 2015, they had the highest overdose death rate in the United States. And a lot of those statistics have yet to be updated because of the pandemic. So McDowell County has a lot of public health challenges. Um, there has been some recent media talking about how all the water in McDowell County is bad. It's very difficult to find safe drinking water there. So we designed a very simple protocol. Um, I did this work with Alistair Cohen, who I mentioned before. He developed the multidimensional poverty assessment tool for the UN. So we used some questions from that, very short. And then I would take three water bottles. So when I meet folks there, I don't have a lot of time to build trust and folks are rightfully very suspicious of those coming in and talking about what they're doing at home. So I went around with community liaisons. We said, can we grab water? It's coming back to you confidentially and you'll just answer these few quick questions. So currently we have collected samples from 43 homes. That includes three homes that are reliant on multiple on-site sources, which I'll talk about in a little. Um, a little over half were reliant on private wells, about a quarter on public water, and the others were reliant on either rainwater cisterns, kind of this um, way that folks will pipe in a stream that's running on the ridge along their house and pipe it down to their house or private springs. Again, I'm throwing a giant bunch of numbers at you, but we're going to walk through it. So this is a measure, these are a summary of all the samples we saw. And the most common contaminant was fecal coliform. We saw two thirds of household samples were positive for coliform, which meant the water was not sterile, about a quarter positive for E. coli. A lot of homes were, were over the sodium guidance level. That's a guidance level, so it doesn't mean an immediate health threat, but it is a problem for those who are on low salt diets, who have um, cardiovascular disease, COPD, diabetes, all of whom are supposed to be on low salt diets. We also saw very high iron and manganese. That is a function of geology. So not surprising, but why some of our water salt looked kind of brown. Breaking this down to municipal versus private, just to give you a couple big picture ideas, to remind you municipal waters, so people who are dependent on water that they pay a water bill for, that is covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. So that's under the auspices of EPA, that water is supposed to be monitored and meet certain guidelines. Versus a private system is something like a household well, it's not, it's not under any regulatory auspices, just the homeowner is responsible for that water quality. So in the municipal systems, nothing positive for E. coli or coliform. I assume that's because they have a great chlorine residual. It's something I'm gonna start measuring in the future. But we saw extremely high levels of sodium. Um, the median value was um, you know, six times the recommended guidance level, which is pretty shocking. Whereas the homes that are, were dependent on private wells, rainwater cisterns, they were largely positive for coliform, about a third positive for E. coli. Many of them also exceeded the sodium guidelines, although the medium was quite a bit lower. I think now we don't know, but we think that the reason is that you often use um, a, um, an exchange filter that uses salt to remove iron and manganese. So in the case of household wells, 
I see this all over the country, people install, they call it a salt filter to get rid of like the brown color, but then they have high salt. Now in the case of the municipal systems, I'm a little bit still unclear why we're seeing these just incredibly high values. And that's something that I'm hoping I can dive into a little bit more deeply with community partners in the future. Now here's where we come to the part that really shocked me. Um, so peeling back yet another layer. So we asked people, what water do you drink? And I should mention that that colleague of mine, the epidemiologist said, oh, Leanne, they're all gonna be dependent on bottled water. And I said, are you kidding? No one's gonna use bottled water. McDowell County is a food desert. There are only two grocery stores in the entire county. It is the only county in the country where they put in a Walmart and it failed because they didn't have enough customers. No one's buying bottled water there. They can't afford it. And I was wrong. 60% of respondents rely on bottled water as their primary source of drinking water. Keep in mind, high poverty region, very difficult, have to drive very far to get this bottled water. 30% also rely on bottled water for all cooking. So they're not just buying bottled water to drink, but to prepare all food. Half the homes that use bottled water said the quality was just satisfactory. It wasn't that they wanted improved taste. It was just that that was the only thing they viewed as safe. This is an enormous cost. When I go to homes, I would walk up and there would just be jugs and jugs of bottled water like this. We also have almost 60% of folks have a significant secondary drinking water source. So they're drinking water. They also use bottled water or they use roadside springs. And then it gets complicated because in some cases I would ask people, what water do you drink? And they would respond, well, what part of the year? And I would say, what do you mean? And they'd say, well, regardless of the time of the year, I use the water that comes out of my tap for cleaning, for taking showers, cleaning my clothes, cleaning my house, because I need a high volume. Now, when it's warm outside, I like to go up to the spring on the mountain because I view that as the most clear. So my drinking and cooking I do from that spring. In the winter, I'll rely on that spring if I can get to it, if the road isn't iced over. If the road is iced over, I will go drop a bucket down the well that's in my front yard because that water comes out more clear than what's in my tap. So this is a quote unquote abandoned well, but it's still in use. So just the complexity of this decision-making and that this is the reality for exposure, this is something that has just in the last few years, even though we've known it's something for a long time, been recognized in developing countries. So in um, low and middle income countries, it's known as Supplemental Unimproved Source Use or SUSU. And I would argue that is something we need to start considering here in the United States as well. It's very difficult to develop public health interventions or to determine whether interventions are working if you don't actually know the water that folks are drinking, because then you don't know the problem you're trying to solve. So what now? I have given you kind of a retrospective of the past seven years that I've been working on this. And every time I peel back a layer, there's one more thing to do. We are continuing this walking census throughout the end of this calendar year. And I'm working with several community partners, Dig Deep, Appalachian Voices and Appalachian Mountain Flows. We're hoping to end up with 60 to 70 samples so that we can do a deeper dive on that analysis. We are also continuing to look at the point of use filters in wells. We recently got a grant from the Virginia Environmental Endowment and are providing these filters free of cost and then monitoring whether people like to use them, what the barriers are, and how often they actually do provide water that meets guidelines. Um, an interesting, very new project is that given what I found in McDowell, we are explicitly going to start looking at the economic, environmental, and health impacts of bottled water. I just cannot ex tell you enough how shocked I was, and I do have to tell Alistair all the time he was right. This woman here is showing me a picture of her water room. She drives um, all the way into Princeton once or twice a month. 
and collects just pallets and pallets of water. And then she also collects water to spring and she has an entire room full of bottled water that she uses for drinking, for some cleaning and for cooking. So this is a very real thing. There is a book that just came out uh, that I'm not an author on, but I'll give it a plug anyway. It came out three weeks ago called Prophets of Distrust, talking about bottled water reliance in the United States. And they also zoomed in on Appalachia. They showed here that almost, that if you compared bottled water sales in non-Appalachian versus Appalachian counties in the same state, you had almost four times the sales in Appalachian counties, almost $10 million in revenue. Now that doesn't make sense since these are also generally the poorest parts of the states, but it shows that people are not, do not trust their water and feel they need an alternative. This is a, this book is really great. It's a really fascinating kind of bird's eye view of the place that bottled water is holding in the water landscape in America, but it doesn't really get at the household expenditures. So I have a team with an economic engineer from ISE, Industrial Systems Engineering, and they're doing a house by house analysis of not just the cost of buying water, but the cost of your time, the wear and tear on your car, particularly if you're driving you know, hours, several times a month. Um, and then we're also comparing water quality, including some emerging contaminants at the point of use and in bottled water. Because fun fact, bottled water does not have to meet SIDWA guidelines. It's regulated not by EPA, but FDA. So I pulled back another layer and found another thing. We also have instituted, this is another picture of Hannah working with a community partner, a simple disinfection program for our springs. So we went and we actually used some Peace Corps and other um, data on just simple home disinfection pro processes you could do with bleach. Um, we printed it out, we analyzed, made sure we had a good protocol in the lab, printed it out on little recipe cards that are laminated and have a little dropper and some other things and have these little packets people can pick up at springs so that they can disinfect their water themselves. When I first started doing this, I got some pushback because some of my colleagues said, it's terrible that you are facilitating bad behavior. People should not be drinking from those springs. They're almost all positive for infectious microorganisms. Um, they're probably positive for parasites like Giardia and Cryptosporidium. And I will say that that is a valid criticism, but um, I'd like to end this presentation with a quote from one of my dearest mentors, Susan Marmagas, who was the founder of the public health program here at Virginia Tech. She sadly passed away in 2018, and in every public health effort, her mantra was, you start where the community is, not where you want the community to be, not your goal for 20 years from now. You have to start with them and be with the community where they are. And where a lot of my communities are is a place where Selecting spring water seems like the best choice for them. And so we are trying to make that, reduce the risk from that and make that a safer choice. And so with that, I hopefully fit that all in. It looks like I did. I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I get very excited and I feel I have so much to add. Leanne, Leanne, thank you very, very much. Sure. And we do have time for questions, but I have to say, Leanne, this really struck a chord for me growing up in Appalachia because we had the family farm. We still have the family farm in Lincoln County. Yep. And the old family house is at the top of the hill, and we have a well there. But as kids, we had the most fun at the bottom of the hill where we had the spring. Of course you did. It's very cultural. These are valued places. And I never really thought about concerns with bacteria in there, but we would both, it was a great place to get the water from the spring and it was the best place to get the crops. So the wildlife used the springs also. So that's kind of what we were consuming in our clean spring water. Okay, I saw a couple of hands up. Dr. Strosnod, was your hand up? Uh, I was just clapping. Oh, well, I see. I see one one um, in the chat. It said the specific filters using at the tap. 
We are using Pure Classic. Um, they're, they roughly retail depending on how good a deal I get at anywhere from $24.99 to $29.99. Um, it's an activated charcoal based, very standard filter. And the reason I don't like love pure more than Brita or any of that, we didn't want to do under the sink because that caught, we wanted something people could install themselves. And these were the filters that were used in Flint. So we had enough data that we could justify giving them out and say that they weren't going to cause harm. So when we were going through IRB, we wanted to use something where, um, where no one would say, hey, you have no idea about this. And then Bill, now do you have a question? <laughs> it, yes, I do. So um, one thing that I've been interested in and shocked by were these anecdotal instances of straight piping sewage uh, yeah. that I noted throughout Appalachia. Um, could you um, speak on that a little bit, you know, with your experience? I know sure. that, that was not the point of this talk, um, but, you know, it is the other side you know, of the situation. Oh. You know, the, the water coming in is bad, and then you got water going out, and it's not to the, the right place either. Correct. So I only talked about water. I didn't talk about wastewater in this, but straight piping is a process where you have an indoor toilet. So if you think back to those initial statistics that I gave you, you know, these people would count as folks with complete indoor plumbing. But when you flush the toilet, it just goes into a pipe that goes into an open sewer behind your house or directly into a stream. There's no septic system or wastewater treatment. It's just straight sewage going into the stream behind your house. Um, McDowell County, I didn't put this stat up there. They estimate that they are um, two thirds reliant on straight pipes. So two out of every three homes there, they have no septic. They have no centralized service. It is just going out the back of the home. Um, yeah. And that's potentially, you know, the source of some of the, the E. coli um, and the fecal indicator bacteria that you're seeing, I assume. Yes, yes. So we're not sure we haven't done source tracking, although that's a project for um, we could start doing. Um, but we kind of assume that there is a stronger human signal than expected. I will say this is going to dovetail, if you don't mind, into this uh, Susan Richardson's question here about waterborne illnesses. I would suspect that the primary source of fecal contamination is actually wildlife because it's up, in, usually the springs are kind of up near the headwaters and the mountains. Um, and there have been cases in New York State, there was an outbreak of cryptosporidium and giardia that was tracked to a roadside spring. This was maybe three or four years ago, uh, Journal of Epidemiology. And what was fascinating was how many homes, I think that ended up like 30 people were sick. And the solution was they concreted over the spring, which I do not think is the right way I don't, the community was very upset. So um, yeah, so thinking about the place that springs hold in people's kind of the landscape of what they value. We have not done in my group any work specifically related on um, what waterborne, whether this correlates to waterborne illness. Um, I have some early work with the epidemiologist I talked about, he just came to Virginia Tech and I was so excited. I have a rural epidemiologist who's excited to work with me and he arrived here in January, 2020. So we are just now getting some of our um, work kind of up and going. I definitely, this work, fun fact, I don't know how USC handled things, but Virginia Tech during the pandemic, during the really heat of it, we were not allowed to leave the state to do work which was ironic because I could be in West Virginia in 25 minutes and that was not allowed. But if I went six hours to the East Coast, that was allowed. And that's just the way it was. Other questions? Okay, well, so hopefully you can hear me, um, but that's great. So um, I, you, you mentioned that with the levels of E. coli and coliform bacteria in these springs, that 
in, in other cases where it's being monitored that that would institute a boil order. Mm -hmm. So have you seen if people regularly do boil their water? Is that just a, that's just a lot of work or they view it as safe? People view it as safe. That is, so that is the advice we give folks when, because every time that we sample a home, we give those folks personalized water quality report with recommendations. And if it's positive for coliform or E. coli, we say you want to treat this water like you were on a hiking or hunting trip. And if you don't have a commercial filter, you should boil it. But we get a lot of rolled eyes. And I don't think people follow that advice. Um, that's actually, I think it is just a lot of work, particularly if you're using, if all the water, if all your water needs to be boiled, people are less likely to do it because it just would take a while. So that's one reason why we decided to go with the two drops of bleach in the gallon jug is that it's less work and there's more. And we, I would say about half and half of the people we've told to do the bleach are like, yeah, I did it or ask me for another dropper. And then half of them are like, oh, you're so nice to care and toss it. Don't pay attention. Dr. Scott. Yeah, great talk, oh, man. I just really enjoyed it. I, I was real interested in the winter time use of the wells. Um, we, obviously, you're not going to have the bacteria necessarily, but you may have a enrichment of viruses. Yes. I'm going to suggest um, if you are going to look at any of the illnesses, if you start to see a spike in the winter time, it might be viruses because the coliflages that basically are in that water feed on the E. coli. So yep. uh, if you're having E. coli, you, you may see some enteric viruses, but I would bet your crypto is going to be your big offender. I would bet. Yep. I like that's what you've already at least preliminarily seen. Yep. So, uh, and you got the great folks at Virginia Tech to do source tracking. I started working with George Simmons who was the guy? Oh, George, I loved George. So you got the God, you know, you got all the great people up there to work with on the source track and so uh, I will say, do you, did, have you ever worked with Chuck Hagedorn? Oh, I worked with Chuck quite a bit. Uh, we, we did some work with uh, a number of studies together. So yeah. with all these guys. Chuck was my neighbor um, until he retired a few years ago. And he still, I see him, I probably text with him a couple times a a week and uh we still see him all the time he's like my kid's extra grandpa well george used to commute down here to columbia and we would meet i was no oh. we would meet here at usc for joint meetings on source tracking techniques and uh, had yeah. a lot of history working with ian chuck so. yeah i will say we've frozen and preserved a lot of samples but not to make grad students or those of you interested in this career it's uh, this is hard work to get funded because it's not, um, which is why I've been largely reliant on kind of internal funds and um, I've gotten several donations because we're not, I mean, in terms of it's a sociologically interesting, but we're really discovering things that we should have solved in this country, um, saying that People have illness because they're drinking E. coli water. Everyone's like, yeah, shock. So. So we've got time for about two more questions and we have two in the chat, but yeah. I do want to offer up a belated thanks to the folks from St. Francis for joining us today. And you got to welcome any Wednesday at noon that you would like to engage with us. So let's see, we had a question from Emily Bors, who's with the Bureau of Water at our Department of Health and Environmental Control. And Emily asked about the possibility of putting filters at the point of distribution from the springs. Has that been considered? Yes. And so it really depends on the spring because some of them have such variable flow. Like you saw that one that was like a waterfall. And then there are some that really go anywhere from a trickle, which again, this, the fact that the flow is so variable suggests to me, and it varies, of course, with rainfall, there's a definite connection to the surface. Um, we have thought about the idea, if you could put in some kind of spring box and almost like a slow sand filter that you could moderate for flow. But the problem is, is that in some of them, they're so close to the road 
that you don't really have the space. So you couldn't really do an end of the pipe solution. You'd need kind of a bigger infrastructure, something with storage and then maybe slow sand filtration and then an access point so that you could moderate the flow going in. Dr. Scott, and then we'll finish up with yeah, Lacey's question. Real quickly, and I was just going to mention, have you considered artificial impoundments? The San Diego Water Reclamation oh. District, they actually get even 99% viral removal with artificial impoundments where you grow lots of macrophytes and the yes. and that would, and then you could filter from that and it would be much, the filters aren't going to flood as much. So we actually looked at that you know, issue here in South Carolina 25 or 30 years ago, because we had a lot of land and you got a lot of land up there where you might be able to do something like that or a rain garden or something like that. So just yeah. Those are great suggestions. The problem is always going to be, it's funny because there's, it's rural, but because of the topography, there actually is never a lot of flat land available. Okay. So, you know, you're right, you're coming right off a mountain and all there is is this narrow holler with like a road and then a couple houses. So that's another reason like straight pipes, yeah. septics aren't a good solution because there's just no land for a leach field. So it's real. It's a very unique. It's a the most beautiful place in the world, but it's a very challenging landscape to do any kind of engineering in. Yeah, well, maybe you could use some artificial tanks and and propagate the ecosystem that way. You know, yeah. Have natural. Just a thought by a well, you might be able to put something. Like I mean, I saw, that's a good idea. It's a good idea. You had that would be kind of neat to tie it into something like that. And, really to come yeah. up. and so our last question is from Lacey. And can you briefly share some of your interview development methods, especially with a non-social science background? So Lacey, thank you for asking me because um, some of it, it started out with me stumbling around. And um, so and I, I really go back and forth. I think that it's very useful that um, not to bifurcate the engineering and the social science, right? You don't want to like just have an engineer who never talks to anybody, but engineers sometimes don't ask the right questions or questions in the most useful way. So I have mostly developed the questionnaires and surveys I've used with people from public health education or epidemiology. Um, I My early surveys, like that four question, that was totally in concert with just um, Susan and some folks in public health that I said, you know, if there were, what are the guidelines? How do I make sure that this is access accessible, that I'm asking easy but useful questions? My survey game has stepped up dramatically since we got some rural epidemiologists here at Virginia Tech. And so I have been reliant on them because they have the expertise in social epidemiology. Uh, to help me develop the right the right questions. And then we do a little bit of, um, I usually get community partners to check out because you never know if the question you're asking is unintentionally offensive or prying or is just not gonna be useful. Um, I've actually found that asking people where their wastewater goes is not useful because no one tells me they have a straight pipe. I can be sitting there seeing the straight pipe and they're not gonna tell me, but. That's because it's technically illegal and it's seen as shameful. So no one is gonna tell me that. So reliant on folks in epidemiology because I am an engineer and then um, reliant on community partners to kind of break it down for me when I'm asking things that are just unhelpful. I hope that answers the question. I will add a, a parting comment to that because you reference health promotion, education, and behavior, which is one of the departments we have here in our own school of public health. And more and more, we are engaging with students who may get a master's degree in HPV and then Absolutely. environmental health sciences for their PhD or vice versa. We've got at least one person in the room here that falls into that category. That is, that is a fantastic way because a lot of our science problems are not technical problems, their issues with communication, their issues with education. Yeah, so. Okay, folks, I said we give 
Well, thank you all for your wonderful questions. I really enjoyed this. And if you are interested in grad school, I'll just shamelessly plug and say, send me an email. Okay, so thank you all again. Thank you very much for participating. I know that next Wednesday, Coffee and I have to be in Merle's Inlet for another workshop. So we will be participating remotely. So we'll be updating everyone. You'll be here, Dr. Stein. I'll be here. I'll be Perfect. So with that, we are done for the day. Thanks to everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Hi, all. Thank you. I'm so glad Susan.